David Richard Berkowitz also known as the son of Sam and 44 caliber killer, is an American serial killer who pleaded guilty to eight shootings that began in New York City on July 29, 1976. Berkowitz grew up in New York City and served in the United States Army. Using a 44 special caliber bulldog revolver, he killed six people and wounded seven others by July 1977. The killing spree terrorized New Yorkers and gained worldwide notoriety. Berkowitz eluded the biggest police manhunt in the history of New York City while leaving letters that mocked the police and promised further crimes, which were highly publicized by the press. But before we get to our main story, kindly remember to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. David Berkowitz was born Richard David Falco on June 1, 1953, in Brooklyn, New York. His mother, Elizabeth Betty Broder, grew up as part of an impoverished Jewish family and was a waitress. She married Tony Falco, an Italian-American, in 1936. After a marriage of fewer than four years, Tony Falco left her for another woman. In 1950, Broder started a relationship with a married man named Joseph Kleinman. 81 three years later, she became pregnant with a child whom she named Richard David Falco. Within a few days of Richard's birth, Broder gave the child away. Although her reasons for doing so are unknown, writers have surmised that Kleinman threatened to abandon her if she kept the baby and used his name. The infant boy was adopted by Pearl and Nathan Berkowitz of the Bronx. The Jewish-American couple was hardware store retailers of modest means and childless in middle age. They reversed the order of the boy's first and middle names and gave him their surname, raising young David Richard Berkowitz as their only child. Journalist John Vincent Sanders wrote that Berkowitz's childhood was somewhat troubled. Although of above-average intelligence, he lost interest in learning at an early age and became infatuated with petty larceny and starting fires. Neighbors and relatives would recall Berkowitz as difficult, spoiled, and a bully. His adoptive parents consulted at least one psychotherapist due to his misconduct, but his misbehavior never resulted in legal intervention or serious mention in his school records. In 1971, at the age of 17, Berkowitz joined the United States Army and served in Fort Knox in the United States and with an infantry division in South Korea. After an honorable discharge in June 1974, he located his birth mother, Betty. After a few visits, she disclosed the details of his birth. The news greatly disturbed Berkowitz, and he was particularly distraught by the array of reluctant father figures. Forensic anthropologist Elliot Layton described Berkowitz's discovery of his adoption and birth details as the primary crisis of his life, a revelation that shattered his sense of identity. His communication with his birth mother later lapsed, but for a time he remained in communication with his half-sister, Ross Lynn. During the mid-1970s, Berkowitz started to commit violent crimes. He bungled the first attempt at murder using a knife, then switched to a handgun and began a lengthy crime spree throughout the New York boroughs of the Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn. He sought young female victims. He was purportedly most attracted to white women with long dark wavy hair. All but one of the crime sites involved two victims, he infamously committed some of his attacks while the women sat with boyfriends in parked cars. He exhibited an enduring enjoyment of his activities, often returning to the scenes of his crimes. Berkowitz claimed that when he was 22 years old he committed his first attack on Christmas Eve, 1975, when he used a hunting knife to stab two women in Co-op City. The first alleged victim, a Hispanic woman, was never identified by police. The second was 15-year-old Michelle Foreman, a sophomore at Truman High School, whom he stabbed six times on a bridge near Drazer Loop and whose injuries were serious enough for her to be hospitalized for a week. Berkowitz was not suspected of these crimes, and soon afterward he relocated to an apartment in Yonkers, New York. Feeling isolated from the world around him, he became an arsonist and set hundreds of fires in New York City without being arrested. 
he began to hear voices of demons that tormented him and told him to commit murder. The first shooting attributed to the son of Sam occurred in the Pelham Bay area of the Bronx. At about 1.10 a.m. on July 29, 1976, Donna Loria, an emergency medical technician, and her friend Jody Valenti were sitting in Valenti's double park truck, discussing their evening at Peachtree's, a new Rochelle discotheque. Loria opened the car door to leave and noticed a man quickly approaching the car. The man produced a pistol from the paper bag that he carried and crouched. He braced one elbow on his knee, aimed his weapon with both hands, and fired. Loria was struck by one bullet that killed her instantly. Valenti was shot in her thigh, and a third bullet missed both women. The shooter turned and walked away quickly. Valenti survived her injury and said that she did not recognize the killer. She described him as a white male in his 30s with a fair complexion, about 5 feet 8 inches tall, and weighing about 91 kilograms. His hair was short, dark, and curly in a mod style. This description was repeated by Loria's father, who claimed to have seen a similar man sitting in a yellow compact car park nearby. Neighbors gave corroborating reports to police that an unfamiliar yellow compact car had been cruising the area for hours before the shooting. Years later, in 1993, Berkowitz admitted in an interview with journalist Moy Terry at the Sullivan Correctional Facility that he had shot Loria and Valenti. On October 23, 1976, a similar shooting occurred in a secluded residential area of Flushing, Queens, next to Bound Park. Carl Denaro, a Citibank security guard, and Rosemary Keenan, a Queens College student, were sitting in Keenan's parked car when the window suddenly shattered. Keenan quickly started the car and sped away for help. The panicked couple did not realize that someone had been shooting at them, even though Denaro was bleeding from a bullet wound to his head. Keenan had only superficial injuries from the broken glass, but Denaro eventually needed a metal plate to replace a portion of his skull. Neither victim saw the attacker. Police determined that the bullets embedded in Keenan's car were .44 caliber, but they were so deformed that they thought it unlikely that they could ever be linked to a particular weapon. Denaro had shoulder-length hair, and police later speculated that the shooter had mistaken him for a woman. Keenan's father was a 20-year veteran police detective of the New York City Police Department, NYPD, causing an intense investigation. As with the Loria, Valenti shooting, however, there seemed not to be any motive for the shooting, and police made little progress with the case. Many details of the Denaro, Keenan shooting were very similar to the Loria, Valenti case, but police did not initially associate them, partly because the shootings occurred in different boroughs and were investigated by different local police precincts. In a March 10, 1977, press conference, NYPD officials and New York City Mayor Abraham Beam declared the same .44 Bulldog revolver had fired the shots that killed Loria and Voskarichin. Official documents were later revealed, however, saying that police strongly suspected the same 44 Bulldog had been used in the shootings, but that the evidence was inconclusive. The crimes were discussed by the local media virtually every day. Circulation increased dramatically for the New York Post and Daily News, newspapers with graphic crime reporting and commentary. Foreign media featured many of the reports as well, including front-page articles of newspapers such as the Vatican's El Osservato Romano, the Hebrew newspaper Mariv, and the Soviet Izvestia. At about 3 a.m. on April 17, 1977, Alexander Esau, a tow truck operator, and Valentina Suriani, a Learman College student were sitting in a car belonging to Esau's brother on the Hutchinson River Parkway service road in the Bronx, about a block from the girl's home and only a few blocks away from the scene of the Loria, Valenti shooting. A resident of a nearby building heard four shots and called the police. Suriani, who was sitting on the driver's seat was shot once and Esau twice, both in the head. Suriani died at the scene, and Esau died in the hospital several hours later without being able to describe his attacker. Police said that the weapon used for the crime was the same as the one which they had suspected in the earlier shootings. 
On September 23, 1993, in an interview with journalist Moy Terry at the Sullivan Correctional Facility, Berkowitz admitted that it was he who committed the crime. Police discovered a handwritten letter near the bodies of Esau and Suriani, written mostly in block capitals with a few lower case letters, and addressed to NYPD Captain Joseph Borelli. With this letter, Berkowitz revealed the name, Son of Sam, for the first time. The press had previously dubbed the killer, the 44 caliber killer, because of his weapon of choice. The letter was initially withheld from the public, but some of its contents were revealed to the press, and the name, Son of Sam, quickly replaced the old name. Suspicion and Arrest Resident Cassilia Davis was walking her dog at the scene of the Moskowitz and Violenta shooting when she saw patrol officer Michael Catanio ticketing a car that was parked near a fire hydrant. Moments after the traffic police had left, a young man walked past her from the area of the car and seemed to study her with some interest. Davis felt concerned because he was wielding in his hand some kind of dark object. She ran to her home only to hear shots fired behind her in the street. Davis remained silent about this experience for four days until she finally contacted the police, who closely checked every car that had been ticketed in the area that night. Berkowitz's 1974 door yellow Ford Galaxy was among the cars that they investigated. On August 9, 1977, NYPD detective James Justice telephoned Yonkers police to ask them to schedule an interview with Berkowitz. Justice asked the Yonkers police for some help tracking down Berkowitz. According to Mike Novotny, a sergeant at the Yonkers Police Department, the Yonkers Police had their suspicions about Berkowitz in connection with other strange crimes in Yonkers, crimes that they saw referred to in one of the Son of Sam letters. Yonkers investigators even told the New York City detective that Berkowitz might be the Son of Sam. The next day, August 10, 1977, police investigated Berkowitz's car that was parked on the street outside his apartment building at 35 Pine Street in Yonkers. They saw a gun in the back seat, searched the car, and found a duffel bag filled with ammunition, maps of the crime scenes, and a threatening letter addressed to Inspector Timothy Dowd of the Omega Task Force. Police decided to wait for Berkowitz to leave the apartment, rather than risk a violent encounter in the building's narrow hallway, they also waited to obtain a search warrant for the apartment, worried that their search might be challenged in court. The initial search of the vehicle was based on the handgun that was visible in the back seat, although possession of such a gun was legal in New York State and required no special permit. The warrant still had not arrived when Berkowitz exited the apartment building at about 10.00 p.m. and entered his car. Detective John Falotico approached the driver's side of the car. Falotico pointed his gun close to Berkowitz's temple, while Detective Sergeant William Godella pointed his gun from the passenger's side. Police searched apartment 7E and found it in disarray, with satanic graffiti on the walls. They also found diaries that he had kept since he was 21 years old, three stenographers' notebooks nearly all full wherein Berkowitz meticulously noted hundreds of arsons that he claimed to have set throughout New York City. Some sources speculate that this number might be over 1,400. Berkowitz was interrogated for about 30 minutes in the early morning of August 11, 1977. He quickly confessed to the shootings and expressed an interest in pleading guilty. The investigation was led by John Keenan, who took the confession. During questioning, Berkowitz claimed that his neighbor's dog was one of the reasons that he killed, stating that the dog demanded the blood of pretty young girls. He said that the Sam mentioned in the first letter was his former neighbor Sam Carr. Berkowitz claimed that Harvey, Carr's black Labrador, was possessed by an ancient demon and that it issued irresistible commands that Berkowitz must kill people. A few weeks after his arrest and confession, Berkowitz was permitted to communicate with the press. In a letter to the New York Post dated September 19, 1977, Berkowitz alluded to his original story of demonic possession, but closed with a warning that has been interpreted by some investigators as an admission of criminal accomplices, I quote, there are other sons out there, God help the world. 
At a press conference in February 1979, however, Berkowitz declared that his previous claims of demonic possession were a hoax. Berkowitz stated in a series of meetings with his special court-appointed psychiatrist David Abraham Sen that he had long contemplated murder to get revenge on a world that he felt had rejected and hurt him. Three separate mental health examinations determined that Berkowitz was competent to stand trial. Despite this, defense lawyers advised Berkowitz to enter a plea of not guilty because of insanity, but Berkowitz refused. He appeared calm in court on May 8, 1978, as he pleaded guilty to all of the shootings. On June 12, 1978, Berkowitz was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison for each murder, to be served consecutively. He was ordered to serve time in Attica Correctional Facility, an upstate New York Supermax prison. Despite prosecutors' objections, the terms of Berkowitz's guilty plea made him eligible for parole in 25 years. And that brings us to the end of this episode, kindly remember to subscribe and comment. It will help the growth of this channel, 